never ceases to amaze me how one picture can capture so many ideas at once and so many conflicting and really wrong ideas at the same time. The one you're about to see has become one of my favorites. Those of you who know what it means to have employees who only get busy when you have to be there know how frustrating that can be. So if we're telling each other, look busy for Jesus, apparently it means we're not busy for Jesus. That can be a problem because we're acting as if he doesn't really see us now, so when he does show up, we better look busy. So what exactly does it mean that Jesus is coming and we need to be about whatever it is he wants us to do? Um, we've looked at some ideas about the end times and come to the conclusion that Jesus doesn't want us trying to figure out what all these symbols represent so that we can figure out who is what. What he really wants us to do is to be about living our daily lives as people who know him. And by doing that, we'll be ready when he comes, whenever it is. So in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Mark chapter 13, Jesus has just finished teaching in the temple. And in Mark 13, beginning of the first verse, you're welcome to follow me if you would choose to. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And we have to admit, the temple of Herod was one of the most magnificent structures of its time. It got people gazing at it, amazed at this temple that had been raised for God. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus. Okay, Lord, we see it. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. So, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. This beautiful, magnificent structure is going to be destroyed. Okay, the temple is the center of worship. This is where God lives. You're telling us that God hasn't even got what it takes to protect his own temple? Jesus has really rattled the disciples to their very core again. And so, continuing in Mark 13, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, looking at this building, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they will are all about to be fulfilled? Signs of the end. This desire to know what the end will be like and how we can get ready for it. That desire has been with us for a long time. Anybody here see the eclipse? We were fortunate to get a pair of those really cool, cheap looking sunglasses that apparently you'll be able to hang on to until the next eclipse. There was a time when people saw an eclipse as an omen of the end, a sign of judgment. Well, now we understand what an eclipse is, and I believe that the word tells us that such overwhelming manifestations, and it really was an amazing thing to see, we're not designed to focus attention on the thing itself. It was designed to point past itself to the creator. This happened, and we understand the moon's orbit being elliptical. It will occasionally pass in front of the sun, and the shadow makes it look like something terrible has happened to the sun. That isn't the case, but it's designed to say, God is so faithful that he regularly allows this to happen because of laws that have been established in creation. The eclipse wasn't designed to look at the eclipse, it was designed to point us to him. But 
far too many folks get wrapped up in the creation and ignore the creator. And so perhaps the most important sign of Jesus' return that people actually notice is the way Jesus' followers deal with crises in their daily lives. At a meeting of the Continental Congress, a severe storm darkened the skies to the point that the people actually feared the end of the world had come. And in the panic and the calls to adjourn, the Speaker of the House, a man named Davenport, called for order. And he said, either this is the end of the world or it is not. If it is not, we have nothing to fear. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty at my post. And he called for candles to be brought. It wasn't the end of the world. But even if it had been, he gives us the right idea. The end of the world doesn't mean panic for the believer. It means we're going home. But until then. So the disciples asked about the fall of the temple and the end of the age, and Jesus gave them some signs. These are things that will mean the temple is about to fall. And in Matthew 24, he listed those things. But then interwoven were some things that didn't directly apply to the temple. They applied to the end that we are looking for. And whether or not Jesus' prophecies related to the temple or related to the end of time that we're looking for, Jesus' command to his disciples was not figure out these prophecies. It was not, when you see these things happening, panic. Jesus' command to them was, when you see these things happening, watch. It's just the beginning. Watch. So after his resurrection, Jesus met with the disciples several times, and on one of those occasions, they said, okay, Lord, is it time for Israel to become its own nation again? Is this the time you're going to restore the nation to Israel? Will the kingdom of Israel become a nation again? And Jesus said, that's not your business. But what is your business is that when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and he will in a short time, You are to be my witnesses. Let me see again. How many of you actually saw the eclipse? Anybody here see it on TV? So if somebody asks you, what was the eclipse like? You could tell them, right? Okay. If somebody asks you, what's life with Jesus like? What would you tell them? Please understand Not the thing you're supposed to tell them. What has your actual experience of Jesus been? We've done evangelistic training in this church. And if you know the right things to say, you can say them to someone. That doesn't necessarily make you a good witness. What makes you a good witness is when you can say, this is what I've experienced about Jesus. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. In Luke 19, that parable of the talents, in Matthew, that parable is set in this whole prophecy thing that Jesus is telling them to watch and prepare. And so using your talents, using your abilities until Jesus comes is a part of what it means to watch. There's a neat phrase there that's only used in the King James. I normally am not a big proponent of phrases from the King James, but this is so cool. It expresses more than just use your money or use your abilities. The phrase is, occupy till I come. It means every part of your life, everything everything that you do, everything that you are, reflects your relationship with Jesus. Daniel 
had received these amazing visions because he was praying. And in this fourth vision, the one in chapters 12, uh, 10 through 12, he prayed for three weeks. He was on a special fast in that time, wanting to understand, Lord, what do these visions mean? Help me understand what all this is about. For three weeks, he did all this. Long time to be fasting. He didn't get a quick response to his prayer. And so he kept praying, kept praying, kept praying. Lord didn't seem to be responding. And then finally, at the end of the three weeks, this angel shows up. And Daniel is so overwhelmed by the sight of this angel. And the angel gives him a clue to what's happening in our world, even today, that was happening then. The angel explained, the moment you began to pray, your prayer was heard because you are highly esteemed by God. But on my way here, I was delayed by the spirit prince of Persia. And so for three weeks, Michael and I dealt with this spirit prince, and I only now got a way to be able to come to you. So does that mean there are those spirit beings who actually can prevent God from helping us? No. It does mean that there are spirit beings who don't like us very much, and they have a lot of power, and they can harm us, or at least they can make us afraid. There really is a limit to what Satan and his horde can do to us. God has established that limit. But the thing he can do when we let him is to make us afraid or impatient or lustful. All those things that are already there and those spirit beings have all kinds of ways of making them worse and exacerbating them in our lives. There was a spiritual battle going on that Daniel wasn't even aware of. The angel made him aware. And now, what's that got to do with us? In Ephesians, as Tim read for us earlier, there is that battle going on. So when that really rude driver, anybody here identify with rude drivers? I mean, you've seen one, not that you've been one. Maybe you have. You know that situation where the left lane merges into the right and you're in the right lane and the guy in the left lane is bound and determined to get in front of you even though there's no room and you don't want to let him in. So you ride the bumper of the guy in front of you. That was a confession, by the way. <laughs> Those very situations, you know, the decent thing, the courteous thing, the Christian thing to do would have been just to back off and let this guy in because at some point I'm going to be in that same situation hoping somebody will let me in. I'm not sanctified, holy yet. Those very kind of situations, those are the places where spiritual warfare is going on. It doesn't look like it. It just looks like some rude guy who's trying to butt in. By the way, I didn't let him in. I'll, I'll finish the story quickly. Didn't let him in, so he got in behind me, cursing me through his open window the whole time. And then as we got past that single lane, there was a turning lane. I'm parked. He pulled up beside me, rolled the window down, and I wish I could let you know what things he said. <laughs> and this went on while this light is still red. That was the longest red light I've ever been in in my life. And I sat and stared straight ahead. You know how after you leave a situation like that, you suddenly think of all the things you wanted to say and could have said? And I realized all it would take would be for me to say the wrong thing at the right time, at that time. And somebody decided that his 357 needed exercise. Okay, that's one concern, but more important than that, 
was the way I dealt with that man going to help him discover Jesus? I'm thinking not. All that took place in that one instance that I felt was just my not being polite to a very rude driver. There was spiritual warfare going on. In the same way that when your kids really get under your skin, or your parents get under your skin, or that neighbor that you wish to goodness would curb that dog gets under your skin. It's not just that there are annoying people around. Remember what Paul said? We do not wrestle with flesh and blood. Okay, sometimes we do, especially if the flesh and blood that you're married to becomes the person that's the problem. But what's going on there is not just that this person's getting under my skin, there is spiritual warfare going on. And Jesus wants us prepared to deal with those day-to-day situations where real spiritual warfare takes place. Sometimes we think of the the phrase spiritual warfare and just try to imagine a demon perched on top of a building somewhere. We want to combat it in Jesus' name. Take the sword of the Spirit and slash at that demon. And the reality is there are times when demonic presence needs to be addressed. But most of the time, and for all of us, it's the day-to-day stuff where the training for spiritual warfare takes place. Janice and I watch... American Ninja Warriors. And if you've not seen this show, these people go through um, the most amazing exercises. These machines that they have to get through, it takes incredible strength and agility. And they train in special gyms to do these things. Our training is not in a special gym. Our training for spiritual warfare is in daily life. Any mixed martial arts fans out here? I'm not one, but I know it's there. Um, And the arena in which mixed martial arts takes place is, has eight sides, so it's called the octagon. And there, It's not just a matter of you against this machine that you have to deal with. It's an actual opponent who's against you. And the reality is we have an opponent who's against us every day, every moment of every day. And our training for this warfare is the same arena as the warfare itself, and that is daily life. So the training becomes a matter of taking that armor that Paul talks about in Ephesians and actually using it. Not the clunky stuff that Middle Ages knights wore. Not even the literal armor of a Roman soldier. That was Paul's pattern. What he actually wants us to do, and they're back in Ephesians 6 again. Stand firm. Oh, but Lord, she looks so good. I wonder what she would feel like with my fingers on her. Don't go there. That's where spiritual warfare takes place, here and here. But Lord, nobody's going to notice if I take this. That's where spiritual warfare takes place. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. How many ads are we exposed to in a day's time? that tell us where to find happiness and has nothing to do with the reality of where to find happiness, what is the truth about this? That's where the battle takes place. Is this true? With the breastplate of righteousness in place, Proverbs said, guard your heart for from it is the very wellspring of life. Be careful what you allow your heart to fall for. Your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Do you have that kind of relationship with the Lord Jesus that when the time comes, you can tell someone about it? The shield of faith. Lord, I trust you. Satan's really giving it to me right now. 
meaning my temper is just about on edge and I'm ready to clock somebody. Lord, I trust you. Help me deal with this. The helmet of salvation. Those thoughts. One of my greatest challenges is that my mind tends to be constantly going, constantly, 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 constantly. And what I feed into it affects it a lot. Be careful the directions that your thoughts go. You do have control over that. And the sword of the Spirit. Get to know the Word. The eclipse generated a lot of interest around the country. But there was another day in which the sun was darkened. The day that Jesus hung on the cross. You cannot tell by looking at this picture that this is the Son of God dying for the sins of the world. But that's what was happening. It was the supreme spiritual battle. And in much the same way, we can't always tell that there's a spiritual battle going on. It feels like I'm just being tempted or I'm mad or I can't take what's going on right now without realizing this is something that God has prepared to help me get through when I ask him and prepare. The training and the warfare are in the same arena. And Father provides what we need to get through this one Pray with me.